Welcome, 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 everyone. It is so nice to have you here today and part of this very special evening that we have been looking forward to since, oh, I guess we planned this back in May. So for those of you who haven't been here before, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Carol Fitzgerald from Reading Group Guides, one of our websites from the Book Report Network. And this is uh, one of our Bookachino Live Book Club events. We also have a book, um, book, book reporter talks to a video podcast series, and we have a Bookachino Live preview event that we do on the second Wednesday of every month. We love connecting with readers like this and especially seeing from where you are all over the country. So our, get, our guest this evening is Alice Elliott Dark, and we're gonna be discussing her absolutely brilliant book. This is a book that I read so slowly because I was savoring every page and writing is just so beautiful. Fellowship Point, which received pre-publication starred reviews from Publishers Weekly, Kirkus, Booklist, Bookpage, and tons of well-known publications, as well as being one of my book reporter bets on selections. The format for tonight's gonna be as follows. Let me start by noting that we're gonna assume that everyone has read the book, meaning this is not the kind of book club you just sip wine and you chit chat. No, 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 we're gonna talk a spoilers. We're assuming you finished it. So that's we're just throwing, throwing that line in the sand right up at the beginning. We're gonna have a couple of members of the audience joining us live to ask their questions that they previously submitted before the event. And then I'll be asking questions for a couple of people who are a little bit more camera shy. And then from there, we're going to go to questions from the audience. So if you have a question that you would like us to ask Alice, please drop it into the Q&A down below. And once again, use the chat for telling us what city and state you're from. Um, so Tom is going to be that. That's only going to be shared with the panelists. So with that housekeeping behind us, let's welcome Alice to the stage. So Alice, it's... Here you are. So wonderful to see you again. So nice to be here, Carol. Thank you so much for inviting me. We had such a fabulous chat about this book. And one of the things we talked about was it's a kind of book that really begs a book club conversation. And we talked about we want to do something in depth, like not something that was just skimming the surface. And we kind of cooked this up while we were on that conversation during that That's interview. true. Yeah. <laughs> And we said, it's a long book. And what we want to do is give people plenty of time to read. So we announced this in May and we said, okay, you have all this time to get it together, folks. And we heard from people all summer that were saying, this is just a beautiful book. Thanks for doing this. So we're just so happy to have it here. So let's start with this. Oh, this book was under contract for 20 years. And it was so interesting. I remember when this book came in, everybody at the publishing house was, it's here, it's here. We're so excited about this. So was this the book you started two decades ago or was this the book that evolved? This was not <clears throat> this was not the book I started <clears throat> two decades ago or that I was under contract for. I was under contract for a completely different book. <clears throat> we decided that that book was poorly timed because another book on a very similar theme came out at the same time. So I tried writing two other novels and I couldn't figure out the right form or I just couldn't get them right. So they're sitting in bins in my basement. <laughs> they're never going to get picked up again. I mean, they were sort of just working things through. Um, it was kind of a tough time too because I had just gotten a job at the university, which is a big job. And my son was a teenager during during these uh, that particular decade. But in 2011, I started to write this book and my son had moved out of the house. My job was much more familiar to me. So I was able to really dig in. Begin and get started there. Well, you know, when we sit there and we talk about this, we feel like you save, we savored your writing, as I said, and you write it and you crafted your sentences so beautifully. When you wrote along, were you honing it as you went? Or was that something you did later on? Did you just get the story down or you, were you working on that at the same time? I, I pretty much work on it at the same time, which isn't to say I don't go back and revise things, but I do within a, a writing session, within a, a day, let's say, I do think about the sentences. I don't really like the whole idea of bad first drafts. You know, it's not fun for me. It's fun for me to to write 
um, sentences that I enjoy writing. That's the fun of it. So I am sort of honing it. And I, I tend to, instead of like tweaking something, I'll just throw it out and start over again if it's okay. not right. So, and, and do the same process, but it does mean I write a lot of sentences. Yeah. So, okay. So if you finish at the end of the day, you've done your writing, do you do writing time? Do you say, I'm going to sit here for X number of hours, X number of words, or is it more like when I've got the right feeling, I'm in it and I'm going to stay as long as I need? A, a little bit of both. For example, I was at a, a residency May, June, when I had all day to write. And I said seven pages a day. I'm going to do seven pages a day. I'm a very bad typist. So seven pages is a lot for me. But it it was also, um, you know, if I did the seven pages in like an hour, let's say, or two hours, I would keep going. I wouldn't say, okay, I did my seven pages. I'm done. I would say, I'll, I'll take a walk and then I'll go back to my desk and do more. So it, it it's not really either timed or page limit. Um, it's a little bit fluid, but I do like to start and then have my first bout of writing of the day go until I suddenly, I like to think of it as until I start thinking, mm -hmm. you know, when I go in, I feel like I go in, <laughs> I go into a place that's not full of ideas and thoughts. It's very intuitive. It's very just listening to the characters and what they're doing. And after about let's say two hours, it's usually 90 minutes to two hours, I'll suddenly go, hmm, maybe I should. And then I'm like, okay, stop right now. Just stop. Because once I start thinking, mm -hmm. I, you know, I start to doubt it. I start to second guess and that's never, never good. So yeah. it's better just to put it down for the day or at least for a few hours. Yeah. And just say, okay, I'm walking away. I can come back and feel good about it tomorrow. Instead of leaving it in a place where it's got a negative connotation that I have to fix it overnight. I have to fix it and be able to figure out what to do. You know? Exactly. I try and keep it as intuitive and sort of playful and fun as possible, which has been a very hard earned because for many years I felt none of those things, but now I do. So I, yeah, I protect that space. Do you think it's from a maturity of writing for like, you know, you're teaching that you feel more comfortable with being in the zone when you're writing? Is that where it's coming from? I I do. I think it's get well, it's actually sort of getting back to the way I did when I was young, because I was a child writer and a teen writer. And I felt very much in the zone when I was writing that. Then I learned a lot about writing and I got very self-conscious mm -hmm. for a while. And now I metabolized everything I learned. So it's just in there and I can, I can go to, you know, I don't have to think about it. I, I know it well enough. I think it, it's really comparable to musicians. Like, you know, when you're learning, it's sort of arduously trying to hit the right note, And then you, you just know how to do it mm -hmm. and you stop worrying and you can just play your instrument. Yeah. It's just, you've got it. You know, you're, you're going to, it's going to be okay. As opposed it's going to be to, okay. Exactly. I'm so stressed <laughs> out about this. And, you know, I think that we're finding that with a lot of the book a year authors right now, they have to do a book a year that the pressure is so great that I have to turn it in by such and such a date. I have to do this. I have to do that. And it's like a, a thinking about story, but it's also thinking about a deadline all the time and what yeah. I have to do. I would, I did not have that issue with this book. Mm -hmm. And I luckily, because it was such a complex book with so many subplots and characters that I really couldn't work on it during my teaching semesters. I couldn't keep it in my head. So I'd have to put it down at the end of the summer, pick it back up at winter vacation, put it back down, pick, you know, so there were, there were a lot of like long breaks. And if I had had to worry about hitting a deadline with that I wouldn't I wouldn't have I just wouldn't have been able to do it I was so far past the deadline for the book but luckily Simon and Schuster did not cancel the contract they still had the contract um that you know I I had a sort of freedom like now I'm now I have a new contract for my new book and it's a little tighter right 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 but you also have completed this one and you're like, oh, okay, I can do this again. Definitely. Yes. I can do this right now. It's no really problem. true. It's really true. This one gave me a lot of confidence because it was so 
much more ambitious than anything I had done before. And the fact that I figured it out and I really came to a place which has helped me in my life too, where I just think the answer will come. Mm -hmm. You know, I might not know now, I might not know in six months, but I will know. <laughs> I will figure this out. And that's just really been kind of a life changing new attitude about yeah. everything, really. Instead of saying, this is going to be where it ends, this is what's going to happen, I'm going to feel it as I go and write what I feel. And I mean, I think that that's the, one of the things that the readers love because there's a lot of emotion written into the book and you can read it in the sentences. And I mean, everyone that was uh, commenting to us about this said it's beautiful sentences, a beautiful writing. And you don't hear that said about every book these days that you feel like you're walking away like you had a beautiful artistic experience at the same time, along with great storytelling. So thank you so much. I appreciate that. I think it's something that I really value in reading. I don't like to read just for story without good sentences. Mm -hmm. I'll just watch TV, which has great stories, uh, you know, on all different kinds of shows. But if I'm reading a book, I really want to be reading beautiful sentences. I was just rereading the, the beginning of the Great Gatsby today, just the first two pages, because I was writing something about it for my sub stack. And I was like this, I, I studied him a lot when I was young, like those sentences, there's nothing like them. Mm -mm. You just fall right into them. They're so, so beautiful. So I think that that was very early on a high value for me. And I wouldn't compare my sentences to his sentences, but I definitely had, um, you know, I definitely have goals with my senses for them to be, uh, you know, something special, I suppose, N not just not just utilitarian, but to have some beauty just in and of themselves. Mm -hmm. We definitely felt that. Definitely feel it. Debbie Moore is going to join us. Debbie is from Syracuse, New York. She's a frequent frequent guest on our show. I think she's been on every, every Book Chino live show. So sometimes she's in Syracuse and then she goes to, to warmer places in the winter. So Debbie, That's why good. don't you ask your questions about Alice? Thanks. Um, Alice, first of all, I love the book. Um, and to Thank the you, Debbie. That had just made, um, I've recommended this book to people of all ages, but I think that one thing I could relate to in this book was that Although I'm not as old as Agnes, I'm getting there. And so those relationships and, and the things that you wrote about, and I, as I was growing up, I spent a lot of summers in Maine. So that combination of things made the book really extra special for me. Um, but I was wondering why you chose to use the Quakers as the founders of Fellowship Point. Is there a historical relationship between the Quakers and the state of Maine or between the Quakers and the Native Americans? Um, in both cases, yes. But uh, that is not exactly why I chose to use the Quakers. I really chose to put them, to have Quakerism in the book because of uh, Philadelphia, because mm -hmm. Agnes and Polly were from Philadelphia. And right. Philadelphia is so much a Quaker city. It's called the Quaker city. Um, it it's just uh, it sort of permeates the city, even for people who have never thought about it for a minute in their life, because so many of the institutions of the city were founded by Quakers. Um, a lot of the, you know, a lot of the business practices, the ideas, it's just sort of hovering around there. And I was not raised as a Quaker myself, but I was very exposed to it when I was young. And it seemed to me when I was thinking about Agnes and Polly, that it would be a perfect faith for them to be practicing um, as as sort of a an all day, every day concern to you know to be thinking through those through that lens of their values um, because there are, you know there are certain ideas like uh, the Quakers were always believed in equality between men and women that was a base tenet and they believed in pacifism they still I mean when I say believe they still do these are still Quaker values and I, I wanted to explore some of that in the book because those are not um, bedrock values of our country you know they yeah. they've been hard-earned and still not still not a pacifist country 
equality of women getting there, <laughs> coming <laughs> along, coming, let's say it's coming along. <laughs> um, and, you know, it, that just really interests me that they were such a successful group and still are when they held values that were really quite different from mainstream American ideas. But I think they went along with a lot of the ideas, the other ideas I was thinking about in the book. Um, I want to ask you two of the two of the primary relationships in the book, Agnes and Polly and Robert and Nan, are relationships that start in childhood and last forever. Do you think there's something special or unique about like lifelong relationships that begin in childhood? Yes, I do. Um, I was just on a weekend with seven, well, there were seven of us who had gone for, uh, to kindergarten together. And, you know, we've known each other all these decades and we haven't been close all these decades, but we've stayed in touch. We got, we got back together. We went, one of them owns a house in Maine. We went to her house. And, you know, it really was that just absolute immediate relaxation, comfort with each other, even if we hadn't spent time in 30 or 40 years together. And I think it was, we talked a lot about it. I think it's that, you know, you know the context of someone when you know them when they're young. You know their family, you know their siblings, you know their house, you know how their parents behave towards them, you know, you know, you know, you know a lot of um, their concerns as a child and people can start to cover those things up as they get older. But, you know, if you knew them when they, then, you know, you know that about them. So you just have a way of cutting through. And believe me, these friends were quite different people now. If we met each other now, some of us would not be friends, you know, mm -hmm. We would, we just wouldn't have enough in common, but having childhood in common, that's just a huge thing to have in common, I think. What do you think? I I agree. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, it's just, it's like you said, you know so much about them. It's like cat, your siblings. Exactly. You know, you, it's like a sibling. Yeah. They're, and, you know, they, no matter what they say now, you know where that's coming from. So it's like, no, you can't put one over on me. It's so I true. really know who you it's are. It's exactly <laughs> true. You, you just have immediate sort of tolerance ex and acceptance because you understand the whole big picture of who they are. Yeah. Um, did you always intend to change Agnes's desire to create a land trust into her wish to give the land back to the Wabanaki people in Mary? Oh. Or was that something that just evolved? It really evolved. In fact, it was... Um, the book was actually, I think it was set into pages before I thought of that. I had a, I had a different ending. And I, I, you know, one day I just thought that's the wrong ending. I have to rewrite the ending. And I still didn't even know what it was going to be, but it happened exactly the way it happens in the book. I had her walk out to the sank and have her trip over a root and kind of hit her head and just have a like a, almost a vision she had a vision and um mm -hmm. i love visions and uh and i saw it the same as when she saw it i didn't think of it again you know as i said earlier i like to stop when i start to think i didn't think it it just it just, just evolved and then and then when it did i thought of course you know i've had all of these clues throughout the book they're very aware that they that they have um, that they're on a land that was used to be an Abenaki summer camp. They have all the artifacts. They've never given them away. They've always kept them there. I mean, I just like planted it, but I mm -hmm. had to I had to somehow put it all together myself. Oops. I didn't. I, yeah, I think it wouldn't have worked as well if I had had like a goal of making a, a statement or something mm -hmm. along those mm -hmm. lines. It, it was really her moral development in the book that allowed her to, to you know, to sort of widen her own vision. And mm -hmm. it's one reason I wanted to write a long book because both Agnes and Polly change quite a bit. And I think it takes a number of pages to really convince readers that someone can change as much as they both did. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, you know, if it happens too fast, it just seems 
it doesn't the reader doesn't experience it along with the characters you know, it's, it yeah. changes changes hard yeah, it is <laughs> well um you know again i i just love the book i can't wait to write your next one um and, and be able to read that and i appreciate i really appreciated all the beautiful sentences um so thank you very much thanks debbie i appreciate those questions Cindy's joining us from South Florida, where she said it's still quite warm. You're still in summer as we turn to fall here. Um, Cindy's been with us many, many times doing events. So I'm gonna ask her to turn on her mic and ask a question. Hi, Cindy. It's okay, don't worry. You have it? <laughs> Let me see if I can end. Um, let me see. I, I don't think I can unmute you. It's in the upper right hand corner. Upper right hand corner. Okay, upper right hand corner. Uh there'll be three dots. And that's I think where you unmute. Audio. There you go. <laughs> How many years of college and you can't unmute a computer? <laughs> well, this wasn't available in college. That's the problem. <laughs> that's true, you know. You know, I'm just really interested. Um Maine, the state of Maine, is such a character in your stories, you know, Mom. And there are so many writers that live in Maine as well. In fact, I um, read that, um, I know Kate Christensen, and she blurbed your book. And she, yeah, she reviewed it, yeah. Yes, that was wonderful. I worked, I workshopped with her a couple of times. But I just really want to know what the attraction to Maine is. Well, I'll just, I'll just speak for myself, but I think Maine is very different from anywhere else. You know, you go, dry, I drive north from New Jersey, and even going across the bridge, there's a bridge from New Hampshire into Maine. It's just completely different once you get in Maine. The trees are different. The feel of the place is different. And the people are very, very particular um, in Maine. And it's just incredibly beautiful there. I don't know. It, it was um, it was settled differently. A lot of people came down from the Maritimes and Canada into Maine from, from there, uh, which isn't true of anywhere else in New England, really. I mean, some of the places they came down, but it was a, a large degree of the settlement came from that direction so so it has that that um scottish and french influence that makes that makes different too and it was quite um it was not as dire uh uh situation up there between the settlers and the and the native people because it wasn't as populated by anybody Mm -hmm. as some of the as some of the other states were so it just has a different history a different feel um yeah and the natural beauty which of course is not, not unique to Maine, but it's a very particular beauty maybe more like uh california coast than and than any anything else right the northern part of california very much so i want to thank you thank you for chatting with all of us and Letting me speak with you. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Cindy. You know, the water up in Maine is different. I remember there was an author recently who had, they were putting blue water on the cover and for her book. And she says, no, it's more gray. It's and gray. Says, you can't put gray water on the cover of a book. So we were holding <laughs> it up and she's like, no, but this is the water color is gray. It's not, people will not know it's Maine because yeah. of that. You know, it's got that green gray. I think gray. that's true. Yeah. I think it's pretty true for the whole East Coast. Like, for example, Jersey Shore, where where I go a lot, it's very gray. Mm -hmm. Like, it's never blue. No. It, <laughs> it's very gray. It kind of depends on, you know, how the sun, what's underneath that the sun reflects through to. And it's it's dark sand, so it's gray. That's right. Well, that's going to be perfect for our next questioner, who's Lisa Hickman. Lisa's on our works with us and she tonight is in Savannah, Georgia. So Lisa, can you turn on your camera? There you come. Hi, Lisa. Yes. Is Hi, it on? Lisa. Yes, you're good. Hi. 
Hi. Hi, Lisa. Um, nice to meet you. And uh, thank you so much for writing such a beautiful book. I love oh. reading a novel that just takes me away from everything. And I feel like when I'm reading your novel, I'm in, I feel like I'm walking side by side with the characters and I, it, the places are characters as well. It's just, it's beautiful. Anyways, did memories of growing up your summer, the way you summered as you were growing up, did that play into your story at I all? Wish, I wish. <laughs> no, I mean, that, that was not my life. Um, I did go to camp in Maine when I was a child, so I had that experience of being in Maine, but I didn't have that kind of family life with a big piece of land or anything like that. I just, it really is a fantasy for me. I, I love, I would have loved to have that. You know, I love the idea of that continuity and security and the right. house is full of the attics with things that people have been collecting over generations. And it's all very appealing to me. So, you know, I, I might have sounded like it was mine because I just went right into it um, without, without, you know, without a lot of ambivalence about it. Uh, but no, it was not really my experience. So I, you had me at page 33 when you said my father owned a house in Stone Harbor. We actually live in my father-in-law's house um, and my mother-in-law's house in Stone Harbor. Nice. And all of my friends are either Penn grads from Haver Haverford, from Philly, uh, Bryn Mawr graduates. Um, well, I went to Penn and I grew up in Bryn Mawr, so. Exactly. And I feel like you really represented the place quite well. And I felt like I was just, it just like really resonated with me that I knew, I just felt like I was inside the book. It was yeah, great. Yeah, that's great. I it love it. So thank you. Lisa, have a lot of your friends read the book yet? Have a lot of friends um, read it? So we considered it for book club, um, but we had a short month. Um, so our, the Yacht Club book club. So um, Marilyn read it. I believe Jen read it. And um, I know a couple other voracious readers that read it as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, Lisa runs a couple of book clubs down in South Jersey. One, yeah. I went to the meeting. I was down there one August and I said, do you want to come to the meeting? And there were 65 people in the room. Yeah. Like I couldn't wow. believe it. And they were yeah. chatting with me out there. I think we we're talking about Tobacco Road, if I remember correctly. Uh, tobacco Wives. Tobacco, tobacco Wives. Tobacco wives. wives. Okay. Yep. And I was so surprised. And then in the off season, she runs a book club at a place called the Reeds and they have mm -hmm. like 55 people at an event. So these are not small book clubs. These no, are no, large no, book that's clubs. huge. Yeah. So it's a lot of fun though. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds wonderful. It's a lot of vetting books for people, a lot of vetting yeah. books. So she reads a lot of books and then said, this one might be too long, but I'll suggest it to my friends who read a lot, you know, Yeah, <laughs> like that. <laughs> Lisa, thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Nice to meet you, Alice. You too. So Linda from Bayport asked me to share her, her question with you. Why did you decide for Robert to accept punishment for a crime he didn't commit? I know he had a prior marijuana possession conviction, but it was way back when he was in college. He had friends in Agnes, Polly, and Polly's husband who were willing to help and support him. That's a really good question. Um, and this isn't the first time someone has brought this up to me that why would Robert not fight harder um, when he when he really literally is innocent of any of these charges? My my I mean, I, there are pages that got cut out of the final book that go into it further. But the real um, his real thinking was that. It was a way uh, for him, and I know this sounds a little far-fetched um, for most people, but for Robert, it wasn't, that Agnes had already given him a lot. She paid for him for to go to school, for to go to college. And then when he did have a, you know, a run-in with the law for smoking weed when he was in college, she took care of all the legal fees and she helped him out with that. Um, 
And that was quite a difficult situation because the drug laws then were so strict. He still has a felony conviction. Mm -hmm. So if he, you know, I think he, part of it was that calculating that um, if he did go to trial and he lost, he could have gotten a lot more jail time than just by uh, pleading and, and taking a minimum sentence. And he got even a less, he got out early. But I think he didn't want to put Agnes through a whole trial uh, because she was, you know, 81 by that point, and uh, and she would have just been 100% involved. Mm -hmm. So I think that was his real thinking, that it was sort of a way of um, paying her back for everything he had done for her by not making her spend this these, these these years of her life involved worrying about him again mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. she also says she loved the twist i read a lot but i didn't see it coming i'm confused how her identity made her protecting fellowship point possible i think i lost her family connection okay she was um the descendant when they when they figured out that she was uh, she, the descendant of the Reed family, who was one of the family, one of the five original families. No one was holding that spot. Her her father Virgil would have held that spot, but when he was there with her as a child, his uncle was still alive, who was the shareholder at that time. So it never went to Virgil. Virgil died before his uncle did. But now, when they find out that nan is alive and she is she is the descendant of the reeds so she becomes a shareholder that means there are three the the agreement is that three people have to agree to break to break the fellowship um in order to make a different decision about the land so she agrees polly agrees and agnes agrees and then they're able to then they're able to do it I hope that makes sense. Mm -hmm. It's basically that she was the heir and there was no heir until they realized who she was. And so they figured out what she was going on. Okay. It makes sense to me. I'm hoping <laughs> it makes sense to her. As it was, well. <laughs> I mean, that took me, it took me so long to figure out that whole scheme of how the land was passed forward and the shares. And I mean, that took me about a year. Yeah. It's like three <laughs> of the five doing this and yeah. Okay. Um, this next question has really interesting timing because um, the Hollywood writer strike ended like just for this question. Melissa from Largo, Florida asks, have you been approached about making this into a movie? Would you? It is would be wonderful as your writing is beautiful and so descriptive. So has there been movie hunting around? There has been a little bit. Nothing has happened so far. I think, you know, I, it's not something I think about a lot, but when I do think about it, I think it would be really fun. The general thinking of people who have considered it is that is miniseries mm -hmm. more than movie. Yeah, and I would love that because I have so much material that sitting in my computer that I didn't that didn't make it into the final book. All all the whole story of Nan when she left the point at age five and goes to Florida and lives with her aunt and everything that happened to her. As I said, all of Robert's story, you hear much more about it. And I mean, I heard, I wrote much more about it. It would be really fun to have that all on the screen in a mini series, but nothing yet. And you could take it in so many different directions then too. It's like, you know, we can move around. It was a couple of years ago, it's more than that, probably a decade now, uh, Mitch Kaplan from Books and Books in Miami became a movie yeah. maker as well. And he and Paul Mazur from his company came to my office and they were talking about books that would be good to be made into movies. And I would describe something, they go, too many sets, too much movement, too many cats. Yes. See, and that's that's the thing that works here is it's main. You can have so much happening up at those houses. And when I sit there and think, and I bring something up and they said, no, it's a battle, too many people for the battle. And it was really interesting to hear. And now when I find, when I watch, I think about things completely differently about how many sets would it be? How many people would be involved? Because it's a big thing. 
It's so true. You know, my story in the gloaming was made into yeah. an HBO film and another film too, but a funny story was that I <clears throat> had had, I met a man at a party who had written the script for HBO. This was before they had optioned it from me. And I was like, how could you even do that? No one's even taken an option yet. And they said, well, they do a, they do a script to see how expensive it's going to be. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. and exactly we say how many sets, how many, you know, how, how, how much um, everything they need, how much character, how many people they have to hire, how many stars, blah, blah, blah. Just, and I was so surprised by that because I had never heard of that before. Mm -hmm. I never heard that they were, um, you know, doing these spec strips just to see how, scripts to see how expensive it was going to be. In, in Gloaming, you actually had two films made of the shorts. It was a short story, correct? Yes, exactly. So you write short, they can make two films <laughs> out of it. Completely and that was it. surprising to me because that I would call a quiet story. It was really mother, son mm -hmm. talking to each other. And I was shocked that ever anyone even wanted to make it into a film but that's the thing you don't know mm -hmm. i went probably why the reason you're saying this would be good because it's not a lot of uh not a lot of expensive sets mm -hmm. and it's characters young and old and maybe three different ages of characters that may be the one thing you've got to do or great makeup one or the other <laughs> I'm going to go to one more question before we head to audience questions. So if anybody's got questions, remember, drop it down in the Q&A. Uh, Tom Donatio, our editorial director, is going to be going to those questions in a couple of minutes. So one more thing is this is also a book about being a writer. So Al Agnes is a writer and you have her write children's books. And she's really well known for this series about a young girl named Nan and a women's fiction series. And these um, the best-selling Franklin Square novels but she hides her older woman's series. Like she doesn't even tell her best friend, Polly. So why does she hold those stories back? Well, talk about the children's ones, but hold the older women's stories back. Well, I think it, you know, part of the reason is because she started out by writing under a pseudonym because her editor just made kind of an offhand remark to her. Like, you're never going to be able to show your face in Philadelphia again after this book comes out because of sort of an expose of young women's lives. And she just kept it. She kept, she kept the pseudonym and then she kept the secret too, because she knew that if she told, you know, if you tell anybody a secret, mm -hmm. you just, <laughs> it's a burden on them to keep it a secret. And most people can't. So the only, you know, she knew that if she told anybody, even her sister, it would be, asking a lot of them and she couldn't tell her best friend Polly because she knew it would be very difficult for Polly not to tell her husband um, and she didn't want to ask her to do that mm -hmm. so she got used to it she got used to working anonymously and to having a lot of freedom to have her social life in Philadelphia move around upon, upon everybody you know Hear, hear their secrets and their stories when she's talking to them and then turn it into fiction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, She knew that people wouldn't talk to her if they knew she was doing that. They'll never tell her another story. You know, right? Exactly, exactly. Well, it's funny because I I only write a weekly newsletter and people say, is this going to end up in the newsletter? Is what we're doing tonight going to end exactly. up in the newsletter? And I go, no, 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 What happens? You know, no, 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 that's not going to happen. But you're sitting there going, that would be a great story. That would be really good. I you know. know. And with, when you're with like a group of writers and someone says something really good or tells a good anecdote or something, everyone's like, hmm, mm. I might use No, no, it's mine. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I'm taking that one with me. Claim that with me. No, that's mine. <laughs> Tom, do you have um, some questions for our from our audience? Yes, we have uh, some good questions here. Um, first, um, Karen says, um, early in the book, Agnes was having trouble writing a novel with main characters being older women in their 80s, maybe. But of course, that's exactly what you were doing with Agnes and Polly. Did you intend for that to be a meta aspect of the novel? Oh, I love that question. I didn't really, um, I didn't really think of it that way. But now that you say that, I love that. Uh, I love that. I was really thinking that Paul, that Agnes is having writer's block because her characters are in their 80s and the 
in the book that she is planning to write. She knows it'll probably be the last one. And she knows um, at least subconsciously, maybe a little more than subconsciously, that she's going to have to have one of them die in the book, um, just realistically at this age. And she just can't bring herself to do that. That's what's stopping her. And I don't think it was stopping me. I didn't really know that one of them was going to die until the end of the book. Um, and as I said, I rewrote the ending. So in my first ending, neither of them died. But then maybe I, you know, maybe it was like life imitating art or something. I don't know. Um, but that was really more my thought was that she couldn't face uh, what she was going to have to do. Another um, question about characters. Um, Linda says one character said that a nine year old child is a perfect human being. What was meant by that? Um, maybe that's just an observation that I've made in my own life and that I attributed to the character that specifically nine-year-old girls, I just think there's there's something really magical and they're just wise, intelligent, insightful, thoughtful, kind, generous. Uh, and then that changes as they get a little bit older. But it just seems... I mean, I think there's a few different perfect ages, but I think nine-year-old girls is a perfect age. And if they ran the world, they'd probably do it well. <laughs> I, I think I agree. That, I that, think that, so that's, too. That's a very good observation, yeah. They put their um, hand on their hip. They know what they want. They know what they're going to do. But they're, I met my mom only taught up to second grade because she, then they start to get fresh. And she says, and I don't want to go to third grade. Third grade is very, very hard. She said, but you know, but they well, definitely nine is the about, yeah nine's about fourth grade i think but i still think there's there's something yeah there's something really powerful about that and then it goes away yeah it goes away when uh when uh hormones hit <laughs> three or four years later might be a little trickier to... exactly yeah. exactly <laughs> um Edie asks do you ever wish you could be one of the characters in fellowship point and if so which one or do you identify with any of the characters um i didn't really identify with any of them and i don't think i wish i were any of them but you know as i'm writing them as i was writing them i certainly saw the world through their eyes when i was with them so in that sense, I, I identified with all of them, um, even Dick, even, you know, even James, even everybody, um, because that's just the way I do it. It's sort of like a channeling or something. Um, I just go as deep into them as I can. And uh, yeah, I, I mean, I'd love to write more maybe about Maud. I think about her still. I don't feel like her story is over at the end of that book. She's still got a lot to go forward. So, but I don't, no, I don't identify with any of them, really. Um, we have a, a few questions about the writing process. Um, Valerie asks, is there a different process when you're writing a novel as opposed to writing short stories? Which do you like writing better? It's a different process for me. Yeah, I, when I write a story, I try to write the whole story at once. And it's not often that I can find the time to do that, but I really try to do it, like just set aside two days, go through the whole draft and then start to work on it. And the working on it can take a while, like years. You know, you often hear writers say, well, that story took me 10 years because you pick it up, you put it down, every every uh, year or so you think you understand it a little better you see what you're trying to do a novel is like really a whole different uh project because there's just so many moving parts and it's so big and i mean i would i'd never be able to pick a novel up and put it down over a 10-year period it's going to have to stay stay more involved with it and make a lot more notes about what I'm thinking about and try, you know trying to remember when I go work on a different part so it's much more like let's say building a house and 
you know, you don't want to walk away from building a house for a year. Mm -hmm. But if you're painting a painting or doing something else, like let's say a short story is like a garden, like you could plant the whole garden in a day, but then you could, you know, then you can really step away and let it sort of do its own thing and come back when it needs a little more. I, I hope that makes, I hope that wasn't too much of a stretch, but um, it's no, just, it totally makes sense, yeah. okay. It makes total sense, yeah. Um, Ellen asks, or actually, let me, while we're on the subject of the, the writing process, um, Pam asks, can you talk about how you worked with your editor? Was it collaborative? It was very collaborative. It was fortunate. I went in with 800 pages uh, and we knew, I knew that I was going to have to cut it. And, you know, that was one of the first things she said to me is we have to cut 200 pages. I was prepared for that. So it, it didn't come as a shock, but I spent one day with her in her office, um, Mary Sue Rucci and, and her assistant at the time, Zach Knoll, who's an editor now himself. And the three of us just went every page, you know, she, that she had marked it up. He had marked it up and they told me their thoughts. And then we, discuss possibilities for what 200 pages could be cut. And it was actually a very easy decision because there were four chapters from four male points of view, Dick, Robert, um, Polly's youngest son, Theo, and um, Virgil. They, they each had a chapter. And Mary Sue just thought, well, if we just pull those chapters, it won't change the book, but it, it it will change the book and it'll be very, very focused on Agnes and Polly, but it wouldn't change anything about the plot because those four chapters were really um, just more about uh, seeing, seeing the insides of those people than having them be part of the plot. The plot was really on Agnes and Polly the whole time. So it was very collaborative and um, very non-adversarial. Mm -hmm. You know, there were things that she would suggest, but she didn't, she would say, well, this part seems like a little long or something. And and then she wouldn't tell me what to do about that. I would just say, okay, I'm hearing you. I'll go look at it. With your students, do you ever identify this is a really great writer? Like when you're sitting with somebody, can you sit there and say, that short story is great. And the way they went into writing that, I see real talent. Can you like yes. see it right away? Uh, instantly. Instantly. I can see it like in the first pair, you know, the first thing they hand me, the first paragraph, I'm like, they, they get it. They know how to do this, which doesn't mean, I mean, the reason I, I like to teach is because people can learn to be a lot better. Mm -hmm. you know, and some of them can even learn to have that sort of natural understanding of how language works. It, I don't think I don't think it's um, completely a talent. I think it, you know it can be learned. Otherwise, I wouldn't teach it. But yes, I do see, and it and it pans out too. Those people have all published books. You know, it's all it's really kind of it's really kind of fascinating. But a lot of the other people have too. So that's why it's fun for me to try and help people get to that place. You know, when I was in college, I wrote, there was a short story that I also turned into a screenplay. And I was always the same professor, I had the same professor three times. And he says, I just want to tell you right now, Adair is not driving to Washington this semester. She's not going, you need a different story. And I turned and I said, <laughs> but it was so much fun to turn into the screenplay. And it's that he goes, third time, not a charm. Come up with something else. So That's very really funny. funny. That's really funny. Let's give it a whirl. Give it a whirl. <laughs> uh, Tommy got something else for us? I'm trying to rein you yeah. in. Um, Ellen asks, do you have any, do you have experience with land trusts, especially as they relate to family heritage? Not personal experience, but I did a lot of research about it mm -hmm. and, um, in Maine. And it's, you know, it's one of those things that since the book has been out every week, someone will come up to me and say, I, I have this family land that We've had it for 200 years and now X, you know, X amount of the people want to sell. And, you know, it's, it's, 
it's a really common story, it seems. And I've heard a lot of different versions of it at this point, but it was never in my particular experience. Mm -hmm. It seems to very traumatic, just like it is in the book. Mm -hmm. um, Pam asks, um, can you please talk about the audiobook? Why do you think it's important to have an audiobook version for this novel? And she says, I'm a huge audiobook reader. Um, well, that really isn't my decision. The publisher decides whether or not they want an audiobook. I, I, I listen to audiobooks all the time, so I was very happy they wanted to do one. It's just a different experience. And a lot of times, like for example, I'm listening to the audiobook right now of uh, Fraud by Sadie Smith. And as soon as I got, you know, a little ways into it, I thought, okay, I also want to read it. So I'm going back and forth. Um, and I do that a lot. And I, I, a lot of people have told me they've done that with this, that they've listen to it and then they read the book afterward or vice versa. I don't know. I think it's just, a, it's really interesting to hear what an experienced reader will do with a story that's different. Um, I was able to have some choice and I love Cassandra Campbell. I think she's one of the best audio book readers. So I was very happy that she could do, could do the book. Mm -hmm. She is really good. And uh, one more thing, I know you kind of touched on this earlier, but um, I just wanted to read a really nice comment from Mary, who says, I live year round on what was a shoreline of family summer cottages. I grew up enjoying multi-generational relationships, summer pastimes with lots of reading and nature. Alice, you capture the annual summer place setting and sensibility so well. And then she asked, did you experience this personally? but I know you didn't really have. Not exactly that like that. Experience. Not exactly like that. Um, I just, you know, I a lot of my friends had it and I would listen to them talk about it. I had a, a small, a very small version of it from um, going to my grandparents in Cape May every summer. Um, and it was somewhat like that. It wasn't, it wasn't the main experience, but it was going back to the same place and, you know, seeing the same kids come every summer. And it was a very gentle, simple life. I mean, my grandparents were very simple, <laughs> you know, and the days were very simple. We really didn't do anything, mm -hmm. but I liked it. Yeah. Get up, you go to the beach, but you know how you go to the beach, you know, where the chairs are. You know, where if you're a little kid, where the sand toys are, you know, exactly what they all look like. And later on, you can look at those things in the garage and you remember exactly what you did, where you went and all those kind of memories are, you know, just sort of all yeah, pushed in together. Very intense sense memories. Yes. And that's what I really like to write about more than anything. I love to write about the place, you know, mm -hmm. and, and every all the details of a place. Mm -hmm. It's just so fun for me. I had so much fun writing Fellowship Point because I just, um, you know, make my coffee, feed my cats, and then go to Fellowship Point. Right. Just sit down, go right there. And it was just so, such a, a wonderful place to be. And it made me feel like I only want to write about places that I really enjoy. I'm not going to write any, any really sordid locations. <laughs> <laughs> because <laughs> I don't want to be in them <laughs> yeah and it's even like when you were in Philly in Philadelphia like you felt like you saw those places I saw the couch they were sitting on I saw when she was waiting for Polly to come over what it was like and I think that it's um Sarah Jane in the audience is saying that she felt like she was at fellowship point after reading the book and me too I felt like I was there but I felt like I was at each place going along I felt like I was packing the car to go and just every single detail, you felt like it was so spelled out that you, it's like, wait, I wasn't there. And I'd almost like to go back up to Maine. I haven't been there for, you know, forever and just say, oh, that's where that would have been. And you also get to design houses, which was exactly. like the most fun thing to do. Like when I was little with bricks, like remember bricks, you could play with bricks and design houses. Yeah. Yeah. So. I mean, it totally is like that. Well, how about designing the whole fellowship point? I mean, yes. yeah. it was really fun to make that up. So many people have told me they know where it is and 
like you know welcome to my mind because that's where it's like i made that place up and it is really fun it's fun it's it's imaginative and creative and yeah it was fun to think of agnes's apartment and yeah all of that I was also remembering the map because I was constantly going back and forth to look at the map and see. Yeah. And I love the way you had it. When you were writing, did you have the map in front of you or you just had it all in your head of where everybody was? Which, uh, eventually I drew the map. Um, and it did really come. It came. I didn't have it at first. It came from, you know, OK, so. William Lee would not give himself the best piece of, you know, the best place for his house. He would give it to his brother right. so then you know then I know like his house would be here that house and I want to have Agnes and Polly living next to each other so and you know and then like where's the graveyard where's the meeting place where they go out every day for their walk so eventually I started like I better I better write this down because <laughs> I'm gonna start getting lost so then I started to you know sort of map map the whole thing out and it was really really fun yeah it just with just seeing this and being able to follow where the light is, like just every single thing and what the names of the houses were. It's really fun. You got to name the houses. You get to name like everything. Exactly. Along the way. It's exactly. all in your hands. Carol, you get it. <laughs> every, every little <laughs> detail. <laughs> Tom, yeah. is there another question there? We do have one more question that just came in from Jody. Um, can you discuss Agnes's epitaph? I loved someone. Um, the last line of the book. Yeah, mm -hmm. people have asked me, who does she mean by that? Um, and I really, in my mind, when I wrote it, I thought that she was thinking about Polly. But um, other people have had different theories about who she, who she was thinking about. You know, maybe it was Nan, maybe, maybe it was um Robert maybe it was Virgil um I don't know I I, I was thinking of Polly but I really like the idea that people have found it to be sort of open-ended and that they can look back at the book and supply their own answer to what she meant I'm okay with that mm -hmm. it's fine it's fine because that became their book it's your book. And then as soon as somebody starts reading, it becomes their book and it becomes their reading experience yeah. and what they walk away with. It's like, who's your favorite character? It's going to depend. It's going to depend on who you are. It does. And it also depends on the, re you know, you can read it at 20 and like one character and read it at 40 and sit and feel like completely differently just to understand the characters differently. I've definitely heard people reread a book like Middlemarch and completely have a different interpretation and attraction to the characters. And it happens to me all the time too, because I'm a big rereader. Mm -hmm. Tom, anything else for us? Or I'm going to go for a question to Alice. Are you anything else? Uh, no, I think that covers okay. everything. So what you're working on now, you're under a new contract, not the 20 year contract. Um, do you have any idea when we might be able to see that a couple of years? Well, yes. I think 2025. Okay. Then you'll come back and you'll talk to us about it. I would love to come back. That would be <laughs> wonderful. This was so much fun. We had so many people here today. I, I'm watching the chat going around and just seeing the comments that people made up. I'll definitely send you the chat later too. So you can oh, okay. see what people were saying as the evening was going on. That's wonderful. So it was such a delight to have you here. We cooked this up when we talked um, earlier this year and we said, oh, this is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to do it. And we wanted to have a really in-depth conversation about the book because what we were really talking about was people don't really talk about books quite the same way anymore. When you're a book group, you talk and then you have some wine and then you talk. But we felt this was a book we really wanted people to get wrapped around. And even if we didn't get to all the questions that people might have tonight, we want to make sure you had a different kind of experience of hearing really what the author was thinking about as she was writing. And it may be an opportunity to reread the book, knowing what Alice was thinking of when she was writing as well, because it changes your interpretation of what was what was happening. And even the map in the front and hearing how she, she pulled that together. Um, we like to bring you an experience where we're enhancing your reading experience instead of just we're all reading a book. So... 
I appreciate that so much. And I felt that the questions tonight were wonderful. Yeah. So we have a great audience. We know we do. We really, really appreciate everybody joining us tonight. Um, we have really terrific people and I'm, a lot of people writing special nights. They've been looking forward to it. It was um, since it was announced. And that's a really lovely thing to be hearing from readers that waited a couple of months for this because we didn't want to do it over the summer. And some people are saying they hadn't started now they can't wait. So it's fine. Like, you know, you oh, know, the ending, right. folks. You know the ending, folks. And I, I, what I'd like each of you to do that enjoyed this evening is I'd love you to make sure you share this book with a couple of other people because you're the biggest ambassadors that we can have right now of going out to talk about this book and share this book with other people. So if you can tell somebody to go out and get a copy and what you're doing, people are writing that they're going to be revisiting it and they want to go back and listen to it now because they feel like they've read it and they want to have a different interpretation. Oh, that's great. I love that. Yeah. And um, Sarah Jane is also saying as a bookseller, it's my pleasure to sell it, which is really, really lovely to hear. Thank you. Thank you, so, Sarah Jane. Yeah. So they're going to recommend it to their book clubs, book clubs, you know, get a lot of time. And um, a lot of people said they want it for their book club. So they're going to be reading it in November. So I'm, you okay. know, if you go on my website, you can drop me a note and ask me to come to your book club Zoom, do a Zoom. And uh, if I can, I will. Yeah, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. And we'll include that when we send the follow up, we'll send a link into, you know, if people do want to be able to do that, provided that your time is there. Alice, it's been great seeing you again. Thank you so yeah, much for joining to us tonight. You, thank you so much. And thank you, everybody else, too, for all the questions and just for caring about this book. I thought, you know, I didn't know it was I thought it was kind of a strange book about two 80 year old women, but it's people really have uh embraced it and that means so much to me yeah. i feel like they're embracing agnes and polly and older women in general well you know someone just being... wrote, pam just wrote you're a generous <laughs> spirit and i think that comes through in the book and i think that you're generous with your characters and how you handle them and i think that's one of the things people are taking away that there's a real care and a thought to the characters that they're actually feeling things with them as well as a result and I think that's a really big deal these days. Yeah. Oh, that's so nice to hear. Because I do, I do feel with them. You know, people have said to me, they don't like Dick. And I'm like, I love Dick. <laughs> I, I understand his limitations, but, you know, I get him. <laughs> and you understand him. why Polly is so different from Agnes. Like why the two yeah. of them are so different, yet they do get along. Exactly. And, yeah. you know, they're just two different people. So exactly. we, appreciate, we appreciate you taking the time. And thank you really, really for making this a very special evening. I'm applauding you from everybody in the audience. Okay. Thank you so much, Carol. And I hope to see you again yep. soon. We'll figure One something out. We'll definitely okay. figure something out. All right. Okay, great. Take, Thanks so thank much. You. I have a couple of more announcements from us tonight. Tonight's of night, um, event will be available on YouTube and our podcast later, probably by the end of this week. And we'll alert you when it's there. And to announce our next Bookachino Live evening event, will be on Wednesday, October 25th at 8 p.m., where our guests are going to be Jody Pico and Jennifer Finney Boylan, and they're going to be talking about their book, Mad Honey. And right now, signups are going to be available for that probably later this evening or tomorrow on Book Reporter and Reading Group Guides. And also, there just happens to be a contest out there right now where uh, three groups of 12 can win copies of Mad Honey. You go out and try and win for your book group. Um, also on Wednesday, October 11th at two o'clock, we're going to be hosting our featuring um, our Bookachino Live book preview event. We're going to be looking at October titles and looking ahead at November and December and sign up with this. You can do on Book Reporter to stay on top of, let me see if I can do my little commercial without looking down, to stay on top of what we're doing, sign up for our newsletter um, so you never miss anything that's going on. You can also hear about the crazy things I'm doing in my life, which I do drop into those. And remember, we have 175 Book Reporter Talks to interviews on our channel, the YouTube channel, Book Report Network, or wherever you listen to podcasts, it's Book Reporter Talks to. And I have a, another in-depth interview with Alice out there. So if she can't make your book club event, you can send them this one. And then you can also send them the one that I had with her. So if she's busy, like marking papers or writing, writing, <laughs> you can feel like you're having the same experience with her. So thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you for being such a great audience and good night.